to a Musical Orbit webinar with Sarah Burnett, fantastic bassoonist. You're going to give us some top, dip, top tips for the bassoon. Uh, anything you'd like to ask about this bassoon, please do send in as a question through the Zoom window. Um, and also you can have a little look at our polling questions um, just for a bit of fun. Uh, give us your answers to those and we'll talk about them later. Um, so Sarah, tell us about yourself first. Tell us about your career so far as a bassoonist. Well, I mean, my career as a bassoonist is, I think what one says, I have a very large portfolio, which is really, really exciting. I'm a, I'm basically, I'm a freelance, but I'm also a member of two orchestras. So I'm principal bassoon of the Britain Symphonia. I'm also principal bassoon of the London Mozart Players. I am professor of bassoon at the Royal College of Music. I teach at the Purcell School and I'm consultant at Birmingham Conservatoire. So. On the, I've got a fantastic amount of wonderful teaching and really lovely playing. And in between Britain Symphonia and the Mozart players, I freelance with most of the UK's orchestras and do a fair bit abroad as well. And um, play for films and yeah, generally have a very nice time. That must be a crazy way to manage your diary though. How do you manage your diary on a practical level? Um, I hope I've put everything in correctly. I also have a diary service, which if I'm in doubt of anything at all, they will keep me right, which is fantastic. So I'm very, very good at keeping them up to date with what's what, because sometimes I really do need to check. And do you know, you just, you end up develop, developing some sort of art of witchcraft of getting things to fit as much as you can. And wherever there's a gap, I put in some teaching. So it's great. Nice. We're going to talk a bit later on about um, techniques for practicing and uh, all sorts of you know, long notes and scales and articulations and stuff. But perhaps we could just start with why the bassoon? Why did you start with the bassoon? Why did you not go down everyone else's route of doing the flute? <laughs> well, precisely because of that. Also because I'm a bit of a stubborn minx and I was told when I decided that I might want to play the bassoon that it was too big for me. So the automatic reaction was, right, watch me. Um, and so I was incredibly fortunate. A friend of the family's had just qualified as a GP, was either going to buy himself a new bassoon or a new car. And mum and dad persuaded him to buy a new bassoon so that I could try his old bassoon. And one thing led to another, and here I am, still <laughs> scraping reeds and cursing them. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question just come in um, saying, Hi, Sarah. Since the instrument's quite heavy, which yeah. I don't know it is, uh, people have been exploring all sorts of things like straps and using spikes more. What do you use, and is it comfortable? Aha! Brilliant question. Mm. Absolutely fantastic. Um, what I use, I have it here, I use the Dutch thigh support. So it attaches round this band here, and this bit here sits on my thigh. And it's absolutely brilliant, um, especially when um, I had 14 years in an opera job. And when you're sitting holding the bassoon in an opera, it does tend to hurt after a while. So that was absolutely brilliant. So this is my solution for when I'm playing chamber music and when I'm sitting in an orchestra. When I'm standing, I have an attachment which goes on the ring here. It's called a balance hanger. And I use um, a harness that goes across my back and fastens at the front. So. Not very elegant, but extremely useful, I would imagine. Uh, uh, yes, exactly. It, you don't look great in a dress. No. Then, that's fine. That, that thing that sits on your leg, it must be very good, sort of, you can move around and don't, don't get sort of stuck in one position, that's... Uh... Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's just as a one note of caution, one person I know actually developed a deep vein thrombosis and they don't know whether it was from sitting still using that because, you know, there's a fair amount of weight on that yeah. or it could have just been inherent anyway. Therefore, if you are thinking of getting one of them, just make sure you wriggle a fair amount. Yes, take a few aspirins every now and again. Oh, yeah. Medical advice on the internet or anything. <laughs> um, Colin asks, um, how important are different makes of bassoon in terms of intonation and sound? Uh, um, fairly, I would say. It's also very much such as in life, what you pay for is generally-ish what you get. 
So a beginner's bassoon will have a reasonable sound, it will have reasonable intonation, it will be reasonably ergonomic, it will be reasonably user friendly. Um, and once you get towards professional instruments, hopefully by then the, the wood will have matured more, you can afford a better quality of crook which for any non-bassoonists on here is this bit here, this metal bit is the crook. Um, and, you know, that's basically how it goes until you get to, I'm incredibly fortunate, I have a heckle bassoon, an old heckle, um, and they're a bit like the Stradivarius of the violin section. Um, they, only, they produce the most wonderful sound, but because it's an old lady, it's not ergonomic at all. And, all heckles have very idiosyncratic intonation, shall we say. Um, so, but the instrument really, really rings when you are sitting and playing it in tune. Therefore, you kind of know when you are in tune that sometimes it isn't entirely natural. <laughs> Love it. Um, Olivia's asking us, uh, lots of bassoonists begin with smaller instruments like the clarinet when they're still quite young. Is this transition easy? And in fact, I've heard about um, a thing called a tenoon which is supposed to be a small bassoon. Do you know anything about that? Yes, well, absolutely. There's a tenor room, a tenor room rather than a bassoon. Yes. So bass for bass clef, tenor for tenor clef. So up we go. Um, um, a tenor room and also a mini bassoon. Um, and I'm going to get this wrong, but I think the tenor room is in G and the mini bassoon is in F, or the other way around. So one of them's a fourth higher than the bassoon, and the other one's a fifth higher than the bassoon. Different fingering then when you, when you no, you learn it with exactly the same fingering. Um, in your left hand thumb, there are many, many, many keys. Um, I think it's eleven at the last count for your left hand thumb. Some of which are missed off the beginner instruments. Um, also, the the spread here and also for this hand here is just your, the holes are a bit closer together because the instrument per se is significantly smaller. Um, it's a fantastic way of starting an instrument. The transition then between a mini bassoon and ten, and um, or a tenoroon and the big full size bassoon does take some getting used to because suddenly your fingers are in different places and there's more keys to press. But you know, with a determined child, and let's face it, most bassoonists are fairly determined. You've got to have that silly streak in you somewhere. Um, it's it's fine. It's absolutely fine. Yeah. And what about going from something like a clarinet to a bassoon? Is that um, a clarinet to bassoon, over to bassoon, flute to bassoon? They're all sort of all right. The um, your embouchure, which is the seal that you make with your mouth around the reed, is very very different for either a clarinetist to a bassoonist or an oboist, they both have significantly tighter embouchures than we do. So um, how we hold the reed is basically as loosely as humanly possible um, so that the reed can really, really resonate in our mouth. So it's our embouchure is much more of an air seal, whereas clarinetists and oboists apply way more pressure on their lips round the reed and round the instrument. Speaking of reeds, um, somebody asks, would you advocate using different reeds for different music? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a horny issue, but um, you do have reeds that will be fantastic at tonguing, but really, really, really rubbish at making a beautiful sound. And then you might have a reed that plays beautifully at the bottom of the instrument. You'll have another reed that plays beautifully at the top of the instrument. And you'll have a reed that's incredibly projected in the tenor register, but a wee bit stuffy. And so you kind of choose your reeds depending on what ensemble you're playing with, what music you're playing with, which hall you're playing in. So generally I have let's be optimistic, on a good day, somewhere between five and 10 to choose from. Good. And have you been known to sort of swap reads in the middle of a performance then? Yeah, I, I mean, the classic is the Rite of Spring or Tchaikovsky's Sixth um, Symphony. So the Rite of Spring is very high, Tchaikovsky's Six is very, very low. Both of them start off with a reasonably pearly, exposed, tricky um, solo. And I mean, without fail, I always do the opening of them on a different route. 
Yeah, it's interesting actually you say that because one of our polling questions uh, that you set us was which 20th century piece of music which starts with an unaccompanied bassoon solo went on to cause a riot during its first performance. A hundred percent of our followers said the right of string by students. Well done, guys. Uh, so we're, we're very proud of you, musical orbit followers, for knowing that. Uh, <laughs> I've always, oh, I've always felt so sorry, but every bassoonist ever that's had to start the right of spring. I, I feel, I, I, it's so amazing. It's such an incredible sound, but uh, it must be one of the most terrifying things to open a piece with. It is. I mean, I was given a couple of fantastic tips for the Rite of Spring. The first time I did it, I was very, very fortunate. I was in the European Union Youth Orchestra and Bernard Heitink was conducting. So it was absolutely the opportunity of a lifetime. I think we played it seven or eight times. We did. I was in the orchestra. You were amazing. <laughs> it was just extraordinary. And um, I, the tip that I was given is write in the fingering for top C at the beginning of the part because it doesn't matter how much you know that that is the fingering for top C. As you're breathing in, you might think, oh, are you sure? Yes. So I, it was absolutely hilarious. I felt like a beginner with my fingering for top C, but it was a godsend. Um, if I wasn't feeling confident, don't stand up when the conductor comes in because actually you're feeling really settled. You're sitting down. You've got everything just right. So don't stand up if you're feeling slightly nervous yeah. um and the other one is to breathe in as an upbeat and then just go otherwise you will spend 30 seconds breathing in because you'll never want to go <laughs> <laughs> oh fantastic um uh, colin's asking again um i have the slowest single tongue in the west oh colin uh, how can i improve it uh, well that is reasonably Tricky to answer, obviously, without seeing Colin and how he tongues. But some simple checks are, first of all, to make sure that the reed is loose enough and free enough to respond. So if at the bottom of the instrument, it isn't speaking instantly, so you play a bottom C and it goes bang, then probably your reed is too thick and too resistant, and therefore, of course, tonguing is going to be really tricky. So say then you do have a reed that is going to tongue. Um, the next thing you have to ensure is that your reed, can you see that Nicole? I can't see it on my screen. But So that the, um, the reed, when you tongue, it hits your tongue, not at the tip, not there, but maybe half a centimetre on the top side of your tongue. And the idea is, if this is your tongue, for your tongue to go down like that as an action rather than like that as an action. And you mustn't ever think of any phrase being staccato because like that you're inter interrupting the airflow. So the idea is to practice legato sometimes, so da, 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 and just flicking your tongue against the reed ever so quickly and then slowly speeding it up. So one of the first exercises for tonguing that my teacher ever gave me was to put the metronome, say on, crotch at equal 60, to play four crotchets, followed by four beats of quavers, so eight quavers, 12 triplets, so four beats of triplets, and then four beats of semi-quavers. And then just put it up a notch again, and put it up a notch again, and put it up a notch again, etc. until you can get as fast as you can get. Then what you need to do is a bit like training yourself how to sprint. So once you've really, really warmed up and it's an amazing day and you're doing crotch equals 160, in which case I want his tips. Um, but, um, you know, say you get above 100 and it's absolutely at your maximum, then bring it back down again a couple of notches or else actually what you're building up is a really bulky muscular tongue rather than a really agile one. So it's a bit like learning to sprint and then you have to cool down again. Yeah, I've been able to have the control as well to do different speeds, not just fast. Yeah, I know uh, lots and lots of people have up to a certain speed and then a gap and then really, really fast. And I suspect that's very similar on every single instrument. I don't know whether it's the same for you with a violin and bowing that you well, get. Vibrato is actually what I'm thinking of. Vibrato. Vibra okay, yeah, exactly. And there's always a critical gap. And you just spend a lot of your life really, really hoping that such and such a conductor isn't going to take such and such a piece at just in that gap. But if it's any consolation to Colin, I am still practicing tonguing. Oh, I don't think so. Uh, Colin says, do you play with vibrato? I do play with vibrato, apparently. Um, 
Vibrato is another issue which is slightly tricky to teach. There are several ways that people can play vibrato. Some people use their lips, some people use their throat, some people use their chest. The trouble with it, certainly throat and chest, is you actually cannot move, um, you can't control how fast the vibrato goes. So it's either on or off, and it ends up being a bit like a nanny goat vibrato. Um, so, uh, or machine gun vibrato. It's not particularly attractive. I try to avoid lip vibrato because similarly, and actually, you know, your lips have got enough to do. The absolute ideal is to do vibrato from the diaphragm. So in the same way as we practice our tonguing exercises, I get my students to practice vibrato exercises significantly slower. So put the metronome down to crotch it equals 40, crotch it equals 30. And you will actually find you can't really get much faster than semi-quavers at 60 with diaphragm pumps. So it's like small crescendos. The idea being that the pitch remains absolutely level, that it doesn't go up and down. And it's almost like small crescendo diminuendos. Whoa, 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 whoa. Rather than whoa, whoa, whoa. If that makes any sense. Absolutely. Um, Olivia's asking, what studies do you use for breath control? Oh. Do you use studies for breath control? I use long notes for breath control. Um, I use long notes certainly. Oh, for a myriad of things, absolute myriad. But um, in terms of literally, how long can I blow out? I will put a timer on and see if I can get past forty seconds. I've got nearly to a minute once. Um, but and it literally at the last few seconds you do feel as if you're about to turn inside out but just keep going um, because you just push through it so it's be fine and you know you will breathe in again you will not faint because your body does want to live it's fine but um, maybe do it the first couple of t times sitting down and you know practice caution maybe um, then also, just how long can I hold it without what I call a wibble? Because one of the hardest things to do on a wind instrument is actually to play a note laser straight without the pitch bending, inflecting in any sense at all. So it's complete lip control, it's complete air control, and fingers crossed there aren't going to be any bubbles as you play. Um, so I would use that for breath control. Then for breath control is slightly different to stamina. I suppose for breath control, I would also use Milda concert studies, both volumes one and two. Um, they're really, really wonderful lyrical exercises. And yes, you need to control your air for them. And the thing is actually to forget that they're studies. You've got to play them as if they're the most wonderful, you know, the new violinists of Paganini. This is our Paganini. Um, um, it, it, they're incredibly lyrical, wonderful pieces of their own right. If you play them like a study, they'll come out like a study and then you kind of annihilate the music. So um, just do that. The other thing is I use Gatti, which is G-A-T-T-I, and he wrote, I think it's 32. I'm now going to forget. He wrote a big, big volume of um, studies, which are feeling nowhere to breathe. There's just nowhere to breathe. Um, so I use that to build stamina. And actually, whilst building stamina, I also play loads and loads and loads of Bach. I nick the Bach cello suites with, unashamed, unashamedly nick them. And I use them to practice just breathing and stamina. Well, it's funny you just mentioned that, actually, because we have somebody asking, do you find that it's more difficult to find solo works for bassoon compared to other instruments like the flute? Um, so is that what you do? You steal stuff, Sarah? Yeah, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. I mean, we do our repertoire is forever broadening. It is very, very scant in the Romantic era. Um, so we get to late classical with Hummel concertos, Weber concertos, that sort of era. And then it really does skip quite a lot until we get to French 20th century composers. So there is that gap and, you know, it's too late to be able to remedy that. I suppose we have Elgar, which is absolutely wonderful to play. You know, the occasional offering. Um, I think when I program solo recitals, 
most bassoon music is somewhere between four and ten minutes long. And what I find particularly difficult is not lurching from seven minute piece to seven minute piece to seven minute piece. Um, so you can find lots and lots of different styles, that's absolutely fine, but they're all about seven minutes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a challenge. That's the human <laughs> threshold for concentrating on a, on a bassoon on its own, maybe, is it? <laughs> Probably a stamina issue. Um, so tell us uh, about practising. Of course, yes. oh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I find it a, a nightmare to sort of have a structure to my practice. My, my mind wanders. And how do you structure your practice? I mean, you're very busy. You haven't got that much spare time, I'm sure. You must be very organised, I imagine. Um, I love your theory. And um, I can be very organised. I used to be superbly organised. So what I did as a student was literally sit down once a week with my diary, write in when I was going to practice, and very frequently what I was going to practice and break it up. So I would put down generally hour long sessions, but sometimes actually you can only do 20 minutes and sometimes I'd, I'd never advocate actually holding a bassoon for much longer than an hour. And in any case, um, to be honest, it's really difficult to concentrate much past 45 minutes. So I would write down my certain, um, I would start, write down certain goals and aims of what I wanted to accomplish within 45 minutes. And if I hadn't accomplished those aims within 45 minutes, I had to continue till an hour. And so, I, okay, fine. And then if I hadn't quite accomplished what I'd set within the hour, then it went into kind of a box at the end. So basically I would timetable myself three or four hours, four hours practice a day with the proviso that there might be a fifth if I hadn't concentrated enough, I hadn't got through enough. So when I was studying, particularly postgraduate, when I was in Hanover in Germany, um, the, the days were long and incredibly empty. So I did a huge amount of practice then, but it, as you said, it was, very, it was without structure, so I had to provide my own structure, my own, cha my own challenges. Nowadays, I have an ongoing list, which is sellotaped to the bottom of my stand of what I need to look at, and once that's kind of a passable state that gets ticked off and I kind of keep on working and it's on a rotate, rotating basis. Um, ridiculously, what I find is if I practice in 10 minute chunks, I frequently achieve as much as if I was doing a half hour chunk. So if I decide I'm going to learn a movement of a symphony, an act of an opera, it's been known in 10 to 15 minutes, I can do it because the concentration required is vast and I know that I've got to get out the door and into my car and onto the tube and the deadline is absolutely real and critical. If I've got all day, it might, I might take all day to accomplish what I can accomplish in 15 minutes if I absolutely have to. The other thing is um, with bassoons or any reed instrument, it is really, really easy to get distracted by, oh, I'll just do this to my reed or I'll just do that to my reed. And I set times per practice when I can look at my reeds, but I won't spend all practice whittling on a reed because the reality is you can get on stage and you can't hold up your hand and go, sorry, do you mind just look at my reed now? Um, you've actually got to blow through and to not always be on an optimal reed you've just got to make it work so part of the practice is learning to control the beast even if it feels as if it's trying to control you um colin's asking how long should you first use a new read for oh that's a tricky one colin um i make my own reads and once i've opened them and done the initial scrape i would probably play them for about five minutes and then put it down for a bit, and then 10 minutes, and then put it down for a bit. And then it would start to come out in the very loud sections of orchestras. That's lovely. Um, and then you think, oh, this sounds nice, and you play it for a quiet section. Oh, that wasn't ready for that yet. Um, so it, it, it slowly changes. Um, I, I slowly build it up, and in between playing, of course, the read changes and its consistency changes, and what you think initially might be lovely might not be, and vice versa, so don't give up immediately. Um, in theory, I have five-ish plus 
concert reads. So I've got a double level read case. And on one side, I've got the reads that are concert ready. And on the other side, I've got reads that I'm blowing in and I'm forever flip, flipping between the pair of them. But I will use reasonably brand new reads for my scales, for my long notes, for my technical exercises. Do you have a humidity controlled read box? We had a read webinar yesterday and I've learned all sorts of things I didn't know before. Um, there you go. Do you know, I was just wondering about getting one of them. So if anybody out there has any strong feelings, I would absolutely be delighted to hear their experiences. Wow, we should get you and Matthew Draper, our read expert. Uh, chatting. Oh, well, that's, you see, because always swear by them, but professional bassoonists just now, the jury is very, very definitely out. Um, there seems to be two on the market, a cheaper one and a very expensive one. The cheaper one seems to be where people go, I don't know. And I don't actually know of anybody that has the £100 read case. So um, <laughs> and I'm not prepared to invest in £100 until someone can tell me it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how long on average should a good read last? Mm. How long is a piece of string? Um, I am very, very fortunate. It seems that my saliva is not very acidic. Therefore, my reads last longer than some. Um, I have had a read that has been brilliant for half a concert. I've put it on for the second half and just thought, oh my word, and that's it, over and out, 45 minutes. Um, but equally, I have reads in my case that have probably been with me since November. Okay. Um, the thing is, Certainly soak them before you put them on. Certainly as you're putting your bassoon back into the cage, bung them back into water and then blow out all the gubbins from the inside because that just helps preserve the length of the reed. Um, and keep it rotating. If I were to just use one reed, I reckon it would be dead at the end of a week. But I, I keep them rotating. It's hard work being a bassoonist. I'm glad I came across those. Yeah, but you've got lots of semi quavers. It's fine. Yeah, but, you know, safety in numbers, hey. <laughs> Sarah, it's been actually fantastic talking to you today. I know that you're going to be off on your travels in a minute, so um, we'll let you go for the moment. But um, if you have any further questions for Sarah, please do email them in to us. And uh, we'll hope to see you again soon when you get back from your travels, Sarah. Thanking you Thank very you much. Very been much. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Bye. Friends are flying through the galaxy